Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Steph. I'm the director of the museum. I want to welcome everybody to the Caldwell Heritage Museum this morning. Need to take care of a few uh, housekeeping chores before we begin. Uh, and the unlikely uh, event of an emergency, there are exits to the building on each end of this hall to your right. There's also an exit to the building behind you on the north end of the building. Restroom facilities are down the hall to your right, all the way to the left for the men, and down the left-hand hall for the ladies. We would ask that if you have any cell phones or electronic devices with you right now, that you turn them off. We have had problems in the past with it interfering with some of our audio and video equipment here. We deal with a old and finicky building, and the technology with it's old and finicky too, so any help you can give us in that regard would be much appreciated. Our program this morning is going to be presented by Mr. Bruce Craig, who I think the vast majority of you are probably well familiar with. Bruce is a lifelong resident of Lenore and Caldwell County, probably one of the city's uh, foremost experts on its downtown history as he grew up literally downtown. Uh, Bruce has been very kind to the museum not only in sharing with us uh, items from his extensive collection of business memorabilia of Lenore but also probably perhaps our best gift any of us can give his time and thought into the museum and I just want to express my personal appreciation to him for what he has helped us out with since he's been associated with us. Of course, Bill Tate, uh, Caldwell now and then, and our uh, ubiquitous uh, videographer and photographer is with us today. He uh, continues his fine work on the Facebook page, and I hope everybody here is familiar with that. If you're not, you need to get online and check that out. It's a valuable resource for the local history and documenting times from the past to the present. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Craig now, and uh, let's give him a warm well. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Thanks sir. I'll hop up there and be ready for it. Well, <clears throat> I know several people that were going to be here today but had conflicts, and they just couldn't be here. And I know I don't have to thank anybody because Jeff's already done all of that. Uh, but I, And I don't mind doing this at all. One thing that I do need to do is that I thank the good Lord above that I'm able to be here because I can't do nothing without Him. Now we're going to start out <clears throat> with, you know, everybody has memories of when they were kids or growing up or whatever, so that's part of mine. Now. My, some of my biggest memories was early, but now, this is my dad right here, and he's standing in front of the State Theater. His name was Audie Craig, and this was in 1934. Now, I knew in growing up that he worked there because, gosh, he told me story after story that I could spend the next three days and tell you what went on at the State Theater. Now, one thing I will tell you, the story is true about rats that was big as cats in there. Because you'd be sitting there and one would come by and hit you in the foot while you was watching a movie. So that was a true story. Uh, but before he was at the State Theater, I knew nothing. His mom died when he was 10. He was living in Collinsville and wanted to come to Lenore, but the family wouldn't. So he leaves home at the age of 14 and comes to Lenore. How he lived and where he lived, I don't know. But I was talking to Whit Howard one day, now this has been 30 years ago, and he knew my dad because, you know, Whit worked at Belk's. No, he stood at the front door and watched people pass. He didn't like working in there when he was young. But he said my dad would come by riding a bicycle that had a sign on it that said Western Union. So he would deliver messages all around Lenore from they would come into the Western Union office and he would deliver those messages. He said, then one day I seen him and he was across the street at the Imperial Theater changing marquee pictures. So he said, I'd holler at him and he'd holler back and said, then I didn't see him. So 
I learned later that he worked at the State Theater. Now, working there, his job was to uh, clean the theater at night when everything was over. If it was the end of the movie, he would change the marquee pictures and put new ones in. Now, go to the next picture there, please. Uh, this was his favorite cowboy. Does anybody know who this is? He's Buck Jones. And he's riding his horse, Silver. You know, all them, they, them guys had their names for their horses. This was called Dawn Trail, and this was 1934. He was a famous cowboy. And, but now, uh, that was his favorite. Now, I don't know whether my dad had some extra pictures or he kept some out. But anyway, we have a pretty good collection of eight by tens of black and whites of marquee pictures. Now, Jeff, go to the next picture. All right, this is a picture of Gene Autry and it's, it's autographed. Now, the picture is important to me, but the backside is what's important. Go to the next one. Now, you can see that on the backside it says the biggest hit tune in years now on screen sensation, south of the border. And it says starring Gene Autry and Smiley Burnett, three big days. But the key part is it's at the State Theater. So this was in 1937, okay? He came to Lenore in 1937, which I thought was really rare and unusual for a guy that big to come to Lenore. But anyway, he did come to Lenore in 1937 and appeared there. Now, the next picture, please. This is a picture of Ray Corrigan. In 1938, he came to Lenore. A cowboy. Now he signed this to Audie Craig, best wishes, Ray Corrigan. Now he was a pretty good cowboy, starred in a lot of movies. Go to the next one. Now this is him, all right, and he's the one on that side. Now they were known as the Three Musketeers, and sometimes they were known as the Range Busters. Then they were called Guns for Justice. Now his name was Crash Corrigan in the movies. The guy on the far side over there was Max Trahoon, and he was known as Lullaby, and he had a dummy. He was a ventriloquist. You know, in these things, a lot of times the cowboys had a comedy guy with them. And so, you know, that went on. Now the guy in the middle changed from time to time, but most of the time the guy in the middle was a singer. So they had to have a singer in a cowboy picture. I mean, that was just things you had to do. So that was those three, and they ran pretty good. So go to the next one, please. Now, I didn't realize that Hopalong Cassidy, who was Boyd, uh, William Boyd, was as early as he was, but him and Tex Ritter were in the 37, 38, and 39, some of the movies. And so this is him, and this some of the first movies of Gabby Hayes because later on you know he played with Roy Rogers and all of them guys you know okay now before we go to the next and I want to ask a question does anybody know what a lobby card is let me see a show of hands you know Phyllis yeah I told you in yonder one day go to the next picture now this is four lobby cards all right what it is, it's a three by five. It's like a postcard. Okay, let's say that this is Tom Tyler and it's called the Two Gun Man. But it's funny, he's only got one gun, you know. But anyway, if he was the star of the movie, they would send a pack of these things and my dad would unwrap it and put it in a machine in the lobby. Therefore, it's called lobby cards. And if you liked him, you would go out, you'd pay a put a penny in and come up with one of these lobby cards. Now, I've probably got, I don't know, 30, 35 of those things that, uh, you know, has uh, dad collected and I mean, there were so many of those actors back in those days. They were called B-movies. All the Westerns were B-movies. Now, he leaves the State Theater somewhere late in 39 
no, I'm sorry, in early 39. He marries my mom in late 39. My sister was born in 41. I was born in 43. And we moved from Ash Street in an apartment over to the Economy Auto store, which was on Harper Avenue upstairs. Go to that picture, please. This is somewhere around 1930 to 32. You see the home electric. Now, later on, this became Heinz Music Store. You might remember that, okay? The next place was Lenore Roofing, but it changed early in the 40s, and it became Swanson's Plumbing, and it stayed there for many years. As a matter of fact, I've got a calendar right here that it's a thermometer, and it's on Swanson's Plumbing in 1942. Now you see the sign that's in the shape of an automobile. That is the Economy Auto Store. Now they started in the about 26 or 27, the best we can find. And folks, you know, sometimes these dates, I'm close. I may not be perfect, but I wasn't there. All I have to do is go on information that I find in old papers and register books and all that stuff. But anyway, just to the left of that, there was a little jewelry store called Dingler's Jewelry Store. Now, right beside of it was a set of steps and a door that you would go upstairs. And we lived in the apartment just over that. Now, it was amazing at the time, the apartment on the left side, my dad's brother, Paul Craig, who was a policeman in the early days, and he lived there. So I've got a ton of memories in this apartment one that really sticks because it lasted and, and done so often was the Iceman. He would drive up in front of the store there and I always had to be the one to hang the ice sign and it would be a 20 or 30 pound chunk of ice. And he would get the ice, bring the ice sign and come up steps and he would put it in the ice box. Now that's what you call home delivery folks. But he'd always turn and say, here, little man, and he would hand me the ice sign, and I would hang it on the side of the ice box where that's where it always stayed. So mom would hand him 20 or 25 cents. Now, how often this happened, I don't know. It could have been five, six, seven days. I know they run from Monday through Friday, maybe some on Saturdays for a commercial place. But that was just one of my memories, and my grandfather lived with us at this time. His name was Monroe Craig, so we had the double apartments right there, the family. Now, think about this, folks. There, there was at least now 24 apartments that was up over businesses, okay? And sometimes it was just regular people like my mom and dad, or maybe the manager of the store lived over one, or uh, the owner of the store actually lived over some of them. So there was apartments all over Lenore. So it was a good thing. My dad didn't drive. So we could go out and go to any grocery store right there close. We could go to any store and my dad just worked down the street. So we didn't need a car. So that's what makes this so important. Now, go to the next picture, please. Now this is about the, the correct time frame because we moved there in early 44 and we stayed there until 1948. And I didn't, only thing I knew as a little boy was on the corner, there was ice cream in that store. So that's all I knew at the time. But it was Stein's Ice Cream Parlor. Now his name was Lawrence F. Stein's and his wife was Nellie B. Stein's. And she had a flower shop in there. Now the next place, if you can see a little bit of a coca-cola sign there and let's see i've got to look up his i know that phyllis knows who this is and i can't remember it right now mr francis what was his db francis okay all right the next place was a west harper curb market and then the little cocoa coca-cola place was the west harper lunch now, Mr. Francis ran both of these, and there was a counter there in front of the curb market, and there were actually some chairs, or, or these little round stools that was right on the sidewalk. So then you have Bowers Department Store, and then you have belts on the corner. Now, 
Steins went from 1936 through 1948. Mr. Francis was there until about 1946. He later had a cafe on Mulberry Street, and then later, I guess, he gave it all up and went to work for uh, Kent Coffee Manufacturing. Now, Bowers stayed there until about, it was either 48 or 49, and then when they left, Belks took that over and it became their shoe store. So that's that whole block right there that you have to deal with. Now, my grandfather would take me down the steps and we'd go over to the ice cream place and I'd get a little cup, and we would sit on these stools there in front of the curb market. And he would either talk to Mr. Francis or somebody and, we'd just, and I'd sit there and enjoy my ice cream. Now, that was just some of the memories that I had right there, but now I'm going to tell you a true story. Should go to the next picture, please. Now, I'll give you three guesses as to who that is, and the first two don't count. What uh, happened to you? <laughs> that, yeah, what happened to me? Uh, I, I got old. Uh, this is when we lived up there. I was three years old at the time. That picture was taken at Tig Studio is where it was taken. Uh, now... <coughs> Uh, but anyway, I'm going to tell you a true story about a street person. I never knew his first name, but he was a Bentley. He was a tall, slim guy, and he was a street person. And Mr. Francis had in the corner a big old stalk of, whole stalk of bananas hanging up there. Well, the Bentley guy comes up, and he's drinking, so Mr. Francis says, Can I help you? And he said, Yes, sir. I want to buy some of them big old yellow beans over there. Well, I guess he proceeds to tell him they're not beans, but they're bananas. But from that day on, this man was known as Yellow Bean Bentley until the day he died. Now, Phyllis knew it, and, and I knew him a lot. I actually had some dealings with him later on. But Phyllis said that her dad was the doctor down at the uh, prison camp. And he'd come home, he'd say, well, I can tell that it's winter time. I said, Yellow Bean's back. He would do something, I guess he was pretty smart. He would do something to get put into the prison camp for two or three months during the winter time because he was a street person. So that way he got three meals a day and got to stay warm. So that, that was pretty good. Now, that's pretty much that right there, and I'm going to stop there, but I'm going to go down... Me and my dad was regular visitors of Hogwaller. Now when you start into Hogwaller, on the left, there was this silver dome, almost like a streetcar diner, but they served hamburgers and hot dogs. Now, hot dogs was three cents. Hamburgers were a nickel. And so my dad would get paid on Fridays, and he would go down there, the five of us, and he'd buy five hot dogs. That was our supper but he only spent 15 cents. So that's pretty good. I mean, I remember when McDonald's came out, they had a 15 cent hamburger. Now go to the next picture, please. I threw this in just so that you would understand. Now, this is Conley and Dewey Eisenhower, and they're down on West Avenue, and you can see by their sign, five cent hamburgers take home a bag full. Now this is somewhere around 1932-33. Now just a little tidbit about this place. To the left of it was a wine and liquor store. And then there was a third store. There were three stores right there together. All right, there was actually a cafe in behind it that Miss Granny Welch ran, but there was several people down in that section that got shot or stabbed or beat up or something. And they got to where they call this Little Chicago, down there on that end of West Avenue. So I guess everything got gone. It's cleaned up a little by now. But uh, that just goes to show you that there was. Where, where is that right now? Where is that place? The West Avenue? Yeah, I mean, where's the West Avenue location today? What is that today? There's a guy in there that has a church in there. You have the old Coble Dairy building, you have the warehouse building, and then the next building. Now, I don't know if this was the next one or the middle one. It was one of the two. But that's where it was located, down on West Avenue. Uh, so, and in Hogwaller, you know, 
You could see anything, do anything, buy anything, sell anything. Everything went on there. I remember, and I, I, I don't like repeating this, but still it happened. My dad, we'd go in, and just a little ways on the right down there, he would talk to this man for a little while. And it's like the coast is clear. So he would open up his car door and reach in the back and get this little brown paper bag out and dad would put it in his pocket and pay the man a little money. Now, there's those three questions again and the first two don't count. It was a pint bottle of bootleg white liquor. Now, across the way, I remember this real heavy set lady and she was a setzer. I remember that because she had always talked to me. Now she, always, she was a big lady and she sat in one of these kind of reclining chairs that had canvas on it. And by the way, that's how Harper Furniture, got, I mean, Hamry Furniture got started by making these chairs and you can fold them up into nothing. But we would buy butter eggs and buttermilk from her. She had the best buttermilk in town. Now, I have two very distinct memories of this down on the right hand side, all right behind Rose's, I could see, and I didn't know who he was at the time, but I, I love music and I have since a real, real early age. But there sat a man on a bucket playing a guitar and singing, and it was Doc Watson, okay? Now, and I'll tell you a little bit about Doc when he would come to Lenore, old Pete Lutz would hire him to sit in his window inside the store and people would go in and listen to him, hopefully buy a piece of furniture. But I can remember as, you know, six, seven, eight years old, I would go in there because I was uptown and I would just stand there and listen to him. Now when Max Department Store, does anybody remember Max? It was across from, you might say, the fire department in that little shopping center there. When they had a grand opening, he came Friday and Saturday night and sang right outside the door store and he had a tin cup on his guitar. He done the same thing when Crest Department Store opened up. And does anybody remember Ames? That was over there where Belks is now. They fought, tore that building down and built the others. But he was there on a Friday and Saturday night. So he would come to Lenore at grand openings hoping he would, you know, make a little money in his tin cup. So now, over here on the right, there was a little guy playing a mandolin. And I, I don't remember him other than I remember him playing. But on another bucket here sit a man called Gurney Watson. Now he was not, he was not a street person, but he didn't work, but he was disabled. And what it was, he had some kind of back disorder and it made him, he, that's the way he walked. And he'd always talk to you up like this, but he played the banjo. Now my dad, he was real, real good on a harmonica. And he always carried a G and a C harp with him. And he would pull out and he would play. And I remember Gurney saying, hey, Audie, you sounding great. Well, a little more about Gurney. He would hang around the cab stand inside. I remember this old dark brown couch in there over on the left hand side. I, I know that couch had to be there 50 years but he would sit there and play his banjo. Well then, there was a, a guy that played the guitar and sang, was Clay Mooney. He owned the cab stand at one time. He owned the little cafe, the streetcar thing at one time. He owned the Gateway Cafe at one time and he had two songs recorded by famous country singers. So he was pretty good. But we would go down on Friday and Saturday nights and my dad would play with him. Now. I hate to say this, but my dad did like to drink a little on Saturday nights. So, but my mom didn't mind it as long as he played three songs. The old rugged cross, the old spinning wheel in the parlor, and then when my blue moon turns to gold again. I'll tell you, now that's, that's a classic right there. But he had to play those for her. That was her favorite songs. Uh, so... We're going to leave that place and we're going to start and go to a, uh, a business. Uh, let's see, let's go to the next picture.
Does anybody have an idea as to who this might be? His name is Charlie Robbins. And he has a cab stand. It's his car just to the left there. All right. If you notice, he's in front of the Gateway Cafe. Uh, now, and that's him standing outside. Now go to the next one. Okay. This is his original business card. And it says, newest and best cab in town, Robbins Cab Company, phone 204. But that's not his phone. It belongs to the Gateway Cafe. They pay for it. He has a booth in there that that's his office, but he don't have to pay. So he's got the best. He don't have no overhead other than his cab. So, but he stays there. This is in the 30s. Now, if you see his prices, you could go to Valme for 25 cents, or you could go to Whitnell for 35, and then you could get more to where you could go to Patterson or Kings Creek and Heartland, you know. But that was his rates, and it didn't matter. One person in the cab, or you could put 30 people in the cab, and he'd take them all for the same price. So that was his first uh, thing about the cab place. Now, this was in the early 30s. Now, in 19... We're pretty sure it was 1938. He moves to North Main Street at a filling station that Gordon Ballou built that George Kroll Sr. is the manager and running at this time. All right. But he has expanded. He's got his own phone now that he's having to pay for. It was phone number two, and it's called the Phone Number Two Cab Company, uh, Lenore, North Carolina, and it says call for and he had four drivers now I should have put these on earlier I can't quite see uh, these names I know one of them is Robert Robbins who was his brother and he was driving for him at the time now there was Walt Goble Charles Corley which I knew this guy and Henry Kemp now Rob Robert was his brother but now they also had another brother by the, is, he was T.H. Robbins, who was Thomas Hamilton Robbins. And everybody knew him, he was a little short guy, smoked a cigar, knew him as Hamp Robbins. And he had a bowling alley and pool room on Mulberry Street in the 30s. Then he went to under Day Vaults and had a pool room called Pocket Billiards. But up there on, and I didn't get this in my PowerPoint, I forgot it, and I read this when I done the Blue Family History, which this is unique advertising, you might say. And it says, sing while you drive. At 45 miles an hour, you sing highways or happy ways. At 55 miles an hour, you sing, I'm but a stranger in this house, heaven is my home. All right, at 65, you sing, nearer my God to thee. You're getting faster. At 75, it's when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <laughs> now, at 85 miles an hour, you sing, Lord, I'm a coming home. So that's a pretty unique thing. Now, he did move just for a short amount of time. And, and you have to understand that uh, he moved at the corner of College Avenue and Mulberry Street, where you drove into the Bank of, Lenor Bank of Granite down there. But that corner was known as Bummer's Corner. You could go and stand there, and you could get a ride to Whitnell or Hudson or Granite Falls. Somebody going that way would just pick you up. So it was Bummer's Corner. Now that's where he went out of business. He was born in 1907 and died in 1970. So uh, that was the thing about Charlie Robbins. Now, uh, what do I have next? Okay, I'm going to leave that there. All right, in, let's see, April the 29th. No, I'm sorry. Uh, May the 16th, 1919. The Universal Phonograph Company came to Lenore, and they put a showroom in Lenore Hardware, and they had a sales rep in there and a manager who was Molten Triplet. It's M-O-L-T-O-N Triplet. 
and he goes in and he's their head salesman for this phonographs. Well, he gets an idea that, why don't I do this? Now, what happens to the universal, I don't know because there's no other recognition about it. It may have stayed or it may have went out. But in March of the 18th of 1920, Mr. Triplett goes into business with his son-in-law who was uh, 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 Ben Montgomery. All right, They go down on Depot Street in a wooden structure. Now Mr. Triplett was a cabinet maker in his time. So he's going to make phonograph record players. So he goes down there with him and they go into business and <clears throat> It's, it's called Thomas, the Nightingales of Phonographs, the Thomas Phonograph Company, Lenore, North Carolina. And folks, right there is a survivor. Now, he get, now, the reason for the name Thomas, his son was 15 at the time, had just passed away. So to honor him, he calls it that. Now, <clears throat> in there, uh, they make the cabinets, but they order the phonograph parts from a place called The Path, P-A-T-H-E, Phonograph and Record Company. And they would send the parts and they would put it inside of this thing of their cabinet. So that's how they came up with that. So they made three different models, a full size, a medium, and a small. Now this is what's amazing. The small was $70. Now just think about this in 1920. The medium size was $100. That model cost you $125. Now, there was people didn't make that in a year's time in 1920. So, but how did they sell so many? They averaged making eight of these things a week. Now, they had to sell them, so they go up the street. On, on West Avenue, and this about where uh, J.C. Penney's old store is right now, there were three wooden structures there, and they were owned by Mr. A. A. Blackwelder, and you know his son was Vernon Blackwelder, the surgeon, but he owned on the upper end. He had a store called the Racket Store, and I think he had a couple of other of these in different places. But the advertisement was, we sell anything and everything for the house. So he sold a little bit of everything. I've got a calendar somewhere, 1924. The building in the middle was a Smith's Cafe. Then the one on the lower side was the Phonograph and Record Store. Now, they went into business with a uh, P.L. Hamby. So there's three people invested in this thing. And they sell the phonographs, they sell records, uh, they sell organs, they sell bathtubs. So that's that. And they're selling them and doing, I guess, doing pretty well. But then in early February the 24th of 1922, Mr. Hamby, he buys out the stock in there from Mr. Triplett and M Montgomery, his son-in-law. So he owns the store, but they're still making them. Now, then he adds tobacco and fancy groceries. I don't know what it was about them early days, but they called it that, that they had groceries and they were fancy. I don't know whether they put bows on them or what, but they called it fancy groceries. Now, uh, then things are going all right, but in, let's see, the date would have been June the 1st of 1923. Mr. Hamby sells his entire store to Mr. A.A. A. Blackwelder. Now they put the phonographs, the organs, and the bathtubs and things at half price. They get rid of what they can and then they move the rest of it up to his store, the racket store. Then they kind of remodel the building and a New York clothing company moves in there at this time in 1923. So you kind of have the history of the phonographs from 1920 through 1923 and we know it's a Thomas and it was built in Lenore. Now, this is a survivor. 
That label is in there. Go to the next picture and I think it shows a little bit more of it. You see the name on the front. Okay. Uh, so we know the history of it. I was in Chuck Troutman's house one day and I took him a picture that I had blowed up and framed it and he lived in one of the Courtney houses when he was a little boy. So I gave him that picture and he said, Bruce, I got something that you may want. Now, let me do this. It works perfect. And this is Roy Acup singing, I saw the light. And so, now it does have a volume control to it. But you know, what's so good about it is, here's a part of Lenore history. And we know where it was made, when it was made, who made it, and all that stuff. So that's a pretty good survivor. Now, if I told you everything that I found out about Lenore hardware, we'd be here for the next three or four days. It was amazing. It was started Let's see, let me get to it here. It, it was formed in 1907. And let's see here, uh, get over here, okay. Formed in 1907. Now this was a stock owned business. You could buy stock in it. There was a lot of people had stock in this thing. Now, the first people, the president was an H.H. H. Hopkins. Vice president was T.H. Brawhill who was Thomas Brawhill, who had furniture, old man Tom, and he had the buffalo power and light that brought electricity to Lenore in 1904. Secretary Treasurer was W.J. Lenore. Now he had a brother that was in there that was W.L. Lenore. So, but it goes on, but anyway, they have trouble building it because of the brick, but that's a huge building. And that building is photographed more than any other building other than the courthouse in Lenore because it's on a ton of the postcards. All right. They opened their doors in November of 1908 and they sell, gosh, they sold uh, nails, bolts, nuts, tools, leather goods, uh, paint, building materials, furniture, and appliances, and probably a few other things. So. It goes on and it changes hands a lot of times except WJ stays the same. There's a Dysart, Dysart in there. There's a, uh, actually Walter L, his brother becomes president. Then there was a, actually a couple of ladies that became president. So it goes on and it does real good even during the depressions because they sell so many different things. Now, in 19, I thought it, I've got 44, so that might be the year. I thought it was 45, but 44, there were two brothers worked in there, and they were Wade McGowan, who owned stock in the Lenore Hardware. Now, his brother, listen to this name, Romulus. Now, how would you like to go around with a name like that? You know, that's kind of like... Uh, na naming you, you boy Sue, you know. But anyway, everybody called him Rome. That was his nickname. So in 44, Wade sells his stock out. So they move up just a little bit about McGowan's. They move up on North Main Street to 117. It's across from the Avon Theater. And at the time, Wade lives in 115 and a half upstairs on the building below him. So they have the McGowan hardware. In the early 50s, about 51, Wade passes away. So it leaves his wife and Rome. Well, Rome don't like the situation. So he leaves and takes his part and he goes up on North Main Street further at the corner of Finley Avenue and North Main and he opens up what was known as Rome McGowan Hardware Store and he has a an electrical 
repair shop in there too. Now he runs and stays there, gosh, till in the mid, May 64, 65. The other one, the lady, she gives it up about 1953, I think it was, that it quit. So, back down to Lenore Hardware. Uh, in, <clears throat> that was in 44, so in the early 50s, there was a manager, his name was Jim Justice, and he was managing it and more or less running it because uh, W.J. Lenore, his health was going down. Now, this is just a, a, a little bit of, I heard a story from a guy back here, that his brother was W.L., and he may have been a drinker. And he would sleep in a car in the alley behind the store. Now that's just, that's all I know. But anyway, his health is going down. So in 1954, they closed the doors to Lenore Hardware. Now Jim Justice, he buys a lot of stuff out of that store and takes it home. Well then, when Courtney's closed, he bought some of that stuff and bought a safe. Well, the safe was for sale at his house down in Hudson. So I went to look at it. Well, that thing was this big and about that tall, and there was no way I could put that on the floor in my house. It would have fell through, so I didn't buy the safe. But I found a lot of other stuff in there, and I said, where did this come from? Oh, it came out of Lenore Hardware. So I buy all he has. There was some other stuff that I heard about that got gone. But anyway, I said, why a cheese cutter in a hardware store? He said, well, what they would do, they'd slice you off a little slice of cheese, you'd get crackers out of a barrel, and you'd sell you a bottle of pop and you could eat and drink while you were shot. Or they would cut you off a half a pound, a pound, or two pounds of cheese. They would take this paper, roll it off, and they would uh, wrap it up, take some string and tie it, then, they weighed it on that set of scales right there. Now, that set of scales, they weighed nuts, bolts, all kinds of nails, cheese, and probably a few other things. But anyway, that set of scales is balanced scales. There's only about this much space on each side that that thing can move. But yet, you can weigh as little as one-eighth of an ounce, and myself, I have weighed as much as 40 pounds on that thing. As long as you got the weights, you can counterbalance it and it'll be exactly level. Now, the good part about it, it is all original, original paint. It has all the original weights with it from four pounds down to a half an ounce. The set of scales is dated 1896 and they still work perfectly today. So I'm just, I'm, I'm really tickled with that. Now, the telephone. It hung on the wall behind. Now that is a 1927 adjustable dial. It was the first phone to come out that you had the ringer, you could talk, you could dial, and you could hear. Before that, it was a crank, you know, and an operator would answer. But that has their phone number on there of 39. So that, and when they got one that went on the counter, they took this down and put it upstairs in storage. So therefore, goes to Jim Justice. Uh, now, I have a lot of other things. I've got a paperweight that says Lenore Hardware. I've got a thermometer and a calendar. It, I think it's 1927. I have a, uh, uh, a sharpening stone there that the box says on it, Lenore Hardware. So they would get that, put their name on it, and sell it. It's kind of like advertising. Uh, now, I have heard of a razor strap that had Lenore hardware on it, but I just heard about it, I've never seen it. Now, over there is a little baby's milk cup, and it has, has kids playing on a seesaw, you know, and on the bottom it does say Lenore hardware. Now this was, fortunately, I found out a lady in Raleigh, North Carolina, that had this. And her mother had something to do, she does not know exactly what, because it may have been before she was born, she don't know, had something to do with Lenore Hardware. Well, she had two of these things. So, 
there's one over there in that cabinet and there's one right here so I own both and it may be the only two that exist that's it's the only ones we've ever seen all right the other string holder there is called a beehive and it's dated February the 14th 1889 so that came out of Lenore hardware so I've got a lot of things that came out of there now when Lenore Hardware opened its doors, out front there was a barber shop in the basement. You could go up the steps to the first national bank. Now early, that, but later it became First Union. They signed a 30 year lease with Lenore Hardware. Well they wanted to break the lease and it was in 1930. So I guess it had to do with depression and money and all that stuff. So they pay Lenore Hardware some money to break the lease. They move across the street in the city office building and then it becomes the first Union National Bank. But there's no worries because the Union National Bank moves in there now and that was helped form by Mr. Gordon Ballou. Now upstairs in all of the rooms. Now not at the same time, but, and I think I had a list I may have left at the house, I did, but anyway, I know this. There were six different lawyers up there in those rooms. Now, you have to think that, and the, I couldn't find those rooms, but there was a reason. Lenore Hardware was on West Avenue, but it don't list those rooms. So, I'm looking on North Main Street one day, and it says rooms, and it's 101 North Main Street, in the Lenore Hardware building. So they're listed on North Main Street. But there were six lawyers in there, there was two insurance companies in there, uh, gosh, there was two dentists, two doctors, there was a Lenore Business School up there, and uh, gosh, there was several other things that was in up there. And on the third floor, there was a mortuary. And they sold coffins and caskets on the third floor. Now, Bernhardt and Siegel's also sold, you know, coffins and caskets. The difference is, a coffin is, you might say, is a pine box. A casket, the same box, but it's lined on the inside, makes it a little better. Now, uh, I have this yardstick, and on this yardstick, it says, they sell furniture, rugs, coffin ca and caskets, farm implements, paint, varnishes, oils, etc. And I think they listed leather and paint stuff on it too. But anyway, a little bit about the coffins. This information came from Banks Haley, who was, Lord have mercy, he was a world of information. I wish he was still alive today because I probably only got a smidgen of stories out of him that he had in his head. So, but he said when his grandfather, now I had his first name, he was a Haley, I think it starts with an M, but I, I can't find it in my notes, but I know he, it was Banks Haley's grandfather. He came here in 1889, was a telegrapher for the, tele, for the railroad that came in 1884. So he builds a house on West Avenue, kind of up on a hill. It was below where Greer Funeral Home was. But anyway, right below it where Coble Dairy Old Building is, Behind there, that building's not there, but there was a little wooden building and a German man in there, and he built coffins, okay? He would put them in Lenore Hardware and Bernhardt and & Siegel's. And so, I do have, I, I come across the best thing I think I've ever found, and it was a, Monroe Wilson was his name, and that man saved every receipt of every store that he bought anything. I don't care if it was drugs or a nail or whatever. But I had a grocery bag full of these receipts. It took me two days to go through them. But I did find two things in there important. One was 1914. He buys a coffin from Lenore Hardware and paid $7.75 for it. But you know, that was pretty cheap back then. Now also, in 1919, he buys a clock, and I, I didn't bring it. I don't like to haul them things around. They're so finicky, being so old. But it was made by the 
the Gilbert Clock Company out of New Haven, Connecticut, and it was made especially for the Belknap Tool Company in Louisville, Kentucky. Well, they sold Belknap tools, so they would get clocks. There was another one that came in at the antique store, and it got gone before I got up there. But a man in Happy Valley had bought it in 1917. Well, this was 1919 in Monroe Wilson, and he paid $5.50 for this clock. So I got the receipt, the clock, and everything. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, pretty much that's a, how are we doing on time? Not too bad. Not too bad. Okay, I got to hurry. But like I say, if I told you everything about Lenore, now, Mr. Lenore was some kind of an official for the city. He could sign death certificates. Now, that's the reason for the mortuary and the coffins and caskets. They, all of it was right there. All you had to do was take the body in, and they'd take care of the rest. But anyhow, we're going to go out the street a little ways, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure about the date. So I know when it opened, beside of Belks, to the right-hand side was the fashion, and that's what it was called first. I think later on it became the fashion shop but it was a women's clothing store. And uh, the man that owned it, it opened in 39, but as best we can tell, he did not take it over until 1940. So we don't know who actually opened it for a year to start with, but the man's name was Oscar Israel. And I think he, his wife and maybe a couple of daughters, Phyllis? We, he just one son, and it was Bill or William Israel, okay. Okay, but anyhow, they run this store for all of these years. Now, when Dula Hospital was going to shut down, there was a lady worked up there, and her name was Sybil Barlow. Now, we're not exactly sure of the years. It may have been 69, but see, Dula was going to shut down. Have you got a year, Phyllis? Yeah, okay. Well, see, I know that it wasn't in 64 because, I'm sorry, 65. My wife was in there giving birth to my daughter. So I know it was after 65. But anyway, she leaves Dula Hospital and goes and buys the fashion shop. Now, uh, so, and she has a sales lady that helped her was Irene Bobbitt. She lived on Broadway Street. Well, we're not sure when it closed down. Let's look at it this way, that when they moved the monument in April of 1963, they put in one-way streets, they built the Lenore Mall, Lenore died. So I'm thinking somewhere around 74, 75, that it shut down. I'm, I'm not sure on that, but I think I'm close. All right, she shuts it down and takes home two items. And I find out about one of them. It's a showcase, and I was big in showcases. So I went to her house and in the basement in Hudson, uh, I see the showcase and I don't want it. It ain't what I want. But there sits this little freezer, ice, ice box. So we talk a little bit and I said, ma'am, where did that come from? She said, oh, that was the Israels. They had it in the shop up there for many years. And so they hooked water. There's a place in the back you can hook water up. Go to the next. That's the inside of it. And they could set a block of ice down in there, and you can see there's a, there's a spigot, and they could have cold water to drink all day long because it was running, but it was staying cold. So it, it, this thing to me has three things about it. One, uh, it came out of a store, and we know it for a fact, even though it ain't got a name on it. But it's, it's rare because of its size. There's not many of these small ones that are around anywhere. If you can find one, you're looking at 500 plus. So, but I said, ma'am, can I buy this from you? And she said, absolutely not. She said, it ain't for sale. And I thought, God, I missed another one. She said, but if you'll keep it, I'll give it to you. Guess what I done? I hugged that lady's neck, I mean to tell you, and I picked that sucker up and took it home, and it's still with me about eight years now. So, 
But then the third part about it is that it does, you can put water in it, so it has three things about it. Now, if I got time, I'm going to tell you. Go one more. Okay, there is the Lenore Hardware building. And that's early, that's before the monument was put up. Ten. Go to the next one. I want to see you see this. Alright. This is a set of balance or they're they're called barrel scales. And that's what they look like when I found them. Go to the next one. Now, six months later, and a bunch of time and money and all that stuff, that's how they came out. And they're the Dayton Scale Company. They're dated 1904. They work perfectly. They came out of CV Steel store. It was a gas station and a grocery store on Lower Creek Drive. Part of the cement is still there right before you get to the old uh, health center. But uh, I've got a receipt from Mr. Wilson again that he bought something in there in the grocery store in 1938 Clyde Taylor when they shut down he gets this set of scales and so I see him at his house and I bug him I don't know Matt might have been a year and finally he said well I'm tired of this Bruce he said take him on home with you so it pays to be buggy sometimes <laughs> but anyhow that is that set of scales and I'm telling you that they're just super I mean you know they're just in such great shape now, I want to tell you a couple of stories if I can. One was about 1931. The Gateway Cafe was for sale. And Mr. Presnell, who owned Presnell Dairy on the Tuttlesville Road and the Caldwell Creamery, he buys the Gateway Cafe. But it's during the Depression, and they ain't got any business. So why did he do it? He's seen an article in the paper that says, we pay we buy thriving businesses and pay cash money for it so he calls them says come to lenore on saturday to the gateway cafe and you can see how good my business is well that morning he goes around town handing everybody a quarter and says go eat at the gateway cafe on me today well here's all of these people eating there the people come and say hey what a business we'll take it they pay him cash money, and he walks away grinning like a, you know, briar rabbit in the briar patch. I mean, he's happy as he can be. Well, as you can figure in the next few days, there's no business. So they struggle with it for about three months. So they call, get a hold of Mr. Prestel. He buys it back for like 10 cents on the dollar, keeps it a couple of months, and sells it again. So pretty good. Now, does anybody remember a bus that run through Lenore? Phyllis does. No, 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 not the bus station. Uh, okay. Uh, the man's name, I got it back here. Let me get it up. Uh, move my mouse a little. Don McLean. Okay. Don McLean. All right, he had a bus, and he would drive it down West Avenue, go all the way out to Gamewell, past the schools, turn around and come back and go up Harper Avenue, go out to Wilkesboro Road and come back and do the same thing. Well, he'd done this four, five, six, seven times a day. And all you had to do was stand beside of the road, hold your hand up, he'd stop, pick you up, you put a dime in his machine and sit down. Now, me and my sister and my mom rode this a couple of times, to Gamewell to visit my dad's aunt. We would get out just at the caution light out there, walk about a quarter of a mile to her house. Well, then we knew when the bus was coming back. So then we would leave and go out there and stand beside the road and see me and my sister rode free. Mama, it cost her 20 cent for a round trip to Gamewell and that ain't bad. But anyhow, now this story has been changed a bunch of times, but I am because of my dad, what, where it was at and everything that happened, I am 99.9% .9 sure that this is true. Down on Depot Street, there was a lot of people that hung out down there. There was another street person, and his name was Lawrence Pendergrace. Now, 
You knew Lawrence by, he was a little kind of a short guy, but the way he walked. He always walked like this, like he had a short leg or a bad hip or something. But anyway, he's standing out there at the road and the bus stops, opens the door. And Lawrence says, uh, Mr. McLean, I need a ride, but I ain't got no money. What about, would you let me ride if I give you a possum? Well, Don McLean goes to fussing at him, probably using a few, few choice words. <laughs> he said, wait, wait, wait. He said, don't get mad. He said, I ain't caught the possum yet. So he slams the door and drives off. But now, this came from a, a little beer joint right there in the corner. A man that run it was Jennings Harris. And my dad would go down there and they could go in the back room and drink beer, which they weren't supposed to. But that's where that story came from was my dad was down there. And so, but you take people, now I'm going to finish here. Uh, the uh, People like Lawrence Pendergrass or Yellow Bean Bentley. You had Bill Hayes, the bottle man. There was another little black man called Snuffy Smith. Then there was Rose South and Coco Melton. You might say in a nice way, ladies of the evening. But there's all kinds of stories about these people and in businesses and people all around Lenore. Now, let me, let me say this. When the Center Theater was built in 1941, now let's go to 1947 because that I've really studied it. So in 47, we had four movie theaters. You could stand on the square and hit every one of them with a rock. We had five uh, drug stores. We had four women's clothing, five men's clothing, and that wasn't counting Smithy's, Belk's, Bowers, uh, the Guarantee Store, Learner's, gosh, Courtney's, Eford's, Collins, J.C. Penney's, all of them in downtown Lenore at one time. We had the best town that they was around here anywhere. And, but it died somewhere between 63 and 65. So, and let me tell you this, that from the very top end of, of North Main Street to the very end of South Main Street, there were 13 grocery stores, 13 of them. Now most of them, all except for two I think was kind of like mom and pop grocery stores. But we had that back in them days and we had them everywhere because people didn't drive. They could just walk over there and get a few things and walk back home. So, you know, but anyway, folks, there's so much that went on in this town that there's so much history. And I'm gonna tell you, all you have to do is find you some old newspapers or borrow a register book out of this back here and learn where your mom and dad lived back in, in the city. The register books, they show everybody that lives here, everywhere they live, shows their phone numbers and says in there, my dad at the time was a furniture worker. So it shows your whole family history. And you know, when you moved, the register book shows that you moved. So, and you know, so that's pretty good. So now, I'm going to stop. Is there anybody uh, that, I don't know if I mentioned this, let me say this. The Universal Theater started in 1926 and in 1932 it was bought out and then became the State Theater. That was where my dad worked, so that was the time frame of that. Does anybody have any questions? If so, we'll let Jeff answer them. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Well, I must have. Well, first, it was D.D. Sudworth. Yeah, when they were tearing that down on that end of town, they moved up there and then they moved to Whitnell, but Shields Hardware was in there for several years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and see, uh, when the hardware store closed and then it became the antique store and the last, I'm going to say about eight years, there's been nothing in there. But now, this lady that owns it, she has a book and it's only one. There were two. They can't find the other one. But it lists every person.
that had stock in that store. I know there was some steels, there was uh, O.P. Lutes, there was some, there were three different Lenores in there. So, uh, you know, but anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So I hope, I appreciate that and I just hope that I brought back some memories or you learned a little something about Lenore. And, but folks, all you have to do is a little bit of digging and I'm telling you. Now, online there is a thing and there's 13 register books on a disc. You can buy that disc for $7. Put it in your computer. You can look at every one of those 13 register books and just learn all about Lenore. So, go out and do a little digging and then you make a presentation. <laughs> so, but folks, I enjoy this. It just tickles me to death to do this. So, that's the reason I'm here. I want to thank everybody for coming today. You have a sheet from your chairs there of upcoming events here at the museum. A lot of them relate to our volunteers. And if you're not a volunteer, we'd like for you to think about becoming a volunteer. We could always use your help around here. Faulkner wrote one time that the past is never really the past. And somebody else said that as long as memory resides in one living soul, we're never truly dead. So that's the business we're in here is to keep memories alive of people and places. And that way, Lenore will never have truly died, or the memories of those we care about never truly die. But we need your help to do that. Thanks for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, I'm Bill Tate with Caldwell County Now and Then on Facebook, where I have restored thousands of photos of Lenore and Caldwell County, some of them going back into the 1890s. There's some videos on there as well. I'm also on the board of directors of our Caldwell Heritage Museum, and if you appreciate what we do, please consider donating and donating your time. Become a volunteer. We would really appreciate it. Thank you so much.